All right. You have all seen those Facebook re memes recently suggesting that people are going to be having more sex. And then uh, guess what? Babies are going to come nine months from now post-COVID. Well, just because everybody's having sex doesn't mean that they're doing it correctly, doing it right, nor more importantly, nor is it pleasurable for the woman. In this uh, video, I have Dr. Kasperson from Washington. She works at uh, Pacific Northwest Urology Specialist, or as an associate, one of the two. And um, we are going to talk about female sexual health. Now, this is going to be an adult topic. We are going to dive into genital urinary anatomy and sex and orgasms and things like that. So if you have tender years or if you have minors around, you may want to watch on the replay or listen on the replay. However, we do encourage you to have uh, questions and, and uh, post them in the comments. We welcome them and we will try to answer them during the live stream today. Hello, my name is John Lin. I'm a urologist in Gilbert, Arizona. Welcome to the program. And uh, we are going to uh, dive right in. Welcome to the program, Kelly. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be great. Now, you, I, I think you are here to get rid of orgasmic inequality. So I'm going to dive right into orgasms. <laughs> Let's talk about female orgasms. How common is it that women actually attain orgasm through penetrative sex from penis in a vagina? It's, it's near, statistically nearly impossible. Um, <laughs> there, there's my dramatic intro. So the study, depending upon what study you read, you're going to have a woman having orgasm from penetrative sex, penis in, in vagina, a ballpark 10% of the time. And that's not enough. <laughs> but traditionally, when we think about sex, we think about penis and vagina. We think about the orgasm being the end all be all and the goal. Um, and, you know, we can definitely have a long conversation about how that's not true. Um, but if you talk about, hey, let's let's stay in the paradigm of heterosexual relationship with orgasm being the goal, um, two things are apparent. The first thing is that women take a longer time to have an orgasm. So if you're starting at the exact same time and the man has an orgasm sooner, then the woman's left hanging. And then number two, the clitoris is the main orgasm organ in females. And depending upon your anatomy, it's either really close to your vagina or relatively really far away from your vagina. So you're not going to get any stimulation with just a penis. Now, so that's where the start of the orgasmic inequality comes from. It does take a woman longer to achieve orgasm and her organ is farther away from where the party is. So much to just just in that short statement there. There's so much to unpack just just in that because um, first of all, men it's a lot easier for men to orgasm, and secondly, despite what um, porn or common folklore may tell you, it penal vaginal sex does not lead to it, it's it's not the end all be all for women, and and most likely does not lead to orgasms for women. Yeah, and I think, you know, where where did the average American or, or the average human get their sex training from, right? Well, first of all, the schools, most states don't actually mandate sexual education, and you don't even, they don't even mandate accurate sexual education. And certainly the clitoris and the vulva is not involved in the female orgasms. It's traditionally the uterus and the ovaries, which has nothing to do with pleasure whatsoever. Um, so our education is lacking. The second place we get education is porn, and porn is a product. It's a consumer product. The product is to get men off as soon as possible, right? So that kind of is kind of the, the goal is not healthy sex education in a relationship. Um, it's, it's to sell something. Um, so our education is lacking. So it's no doubt that, you know, both women and men have really no idea of, of how things actually work. Yeah, that is uh, very, very unfortunate because we get, well, first of all, in, in school, you get sex education. It's more on reproduction, like you said, and also sexually transmitted infections. It, there's no coverage of what is a clitoris. And clitoris, everybody, well, not everybody, but most people know clitoris as just that tiny little, I hope most most people know this, it's a tiny little thing that sticks out under a, a covering of some sort. When in fact, that that little protrusion is just a very, very small part of what is what is the, the clitoris? It, it actually extends further into the body. Yeah. And, it, and knowing this anatomy really helps women feel like they're normal or helps men understand why women might need something else besides a penis to have pleasure. So the clitoris actually wraps inside the body and then around underneath the labia. 
And once you learn that anatomy, then you're like, oh, well, that's why labia stimulation feels good. That's why rubbing on the pubic bone feels good. That's where all the other, because your clitoris is, is inside there as well. It's not just you know, literally the tip of the iceberg. Well, there, there's so much, uh, so much that could be said. We, you know, I, I wanted to make sure we jump right into orgasms and then cover the clitoris because that is one of the most often uh, misunderstood and not talked about part of the female anatomy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's and, and same with the vulva, right? It's like we just uh, most women don't know where their vulva is. And so, you know, I work with women and men all day long in my life. And it's like, it's not the guy's fault. You know, there shouldn't be the because women don't know. Right. So it's really education of everybody and a woman understanding her own body, because how is the guy going to know how the owner's manual works if the woman doesn't even know? So it's really a team effort. Yes. And I want to uh, remind the audience that is watching uh, to uh, please ask any questions in the comments uh, regarding female sexual health. We are uh, on line with uh, Dr. Kelly Casperson, a uh, female sex expert in uh, Washington and uh, we are talking about female sexual health. So let's talk, let's move on to, from uh, orgasms to, um, I don't want to move on from orgasms. Let's talk about, let's talk about orgasms some more. <laughs> let's okay, let's talk, talk about orgasms some more. That, that, so yeah. women can get orgasms in lots of different ways. Women can get orgasms from lots of different stimulations. And on my job, like I'm a urologist, I love educating people, but my job is never to tell people how to have sex. <laughs> I am not a here for a to-do manual. So it's really, you know, knowing your body, figuring out what is good, a great resource for women, uh, a, like a website with lots of videos is omgyes.com. So omgyes.com. If you are a medical provider, they actually do offer discounts um, for medical providers for that. I'm um, so that and it's super cool and nerdy too, because they really go into the statistics of it. They'll be like, 72% of women have pleasure with this, 43% of women have pleasure with this. And like, they've done all this data and it's not just young women, it's perimenopausal, postmenopausal. They really look at all ages because remember what works for you when you're 18 does not always work for you when you're 50. And, and kind of some people get stuck on that. They're like, well, when I was 18, it was so easy. And it's like, well, lots of things were easier when we were 18, but that's okay. We don't all want to be 18 anymore. You know, as our bodies change, as our hormones change, techniques and things that we do might change. And okay. that's okay. Yes. You're not I, I, yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. When it comes to orgasms, we talked about the clitoris and how it's not just a little protrusion, but also extends into the, into the vaginal area. Um, what about uh, different types of you know, orgasms and clitoris that, that direct some stimulation is uh, one way to for a woman to achieve orgasm. What about other areas in the uh, vaginal area that may also help with orgasms? Oh, sure. So it's super interesting. I mean, you can get really into the. I was a neuroscience undergrad, which I was like, I'm never going to use that. I'm a urologist. And now it's kind of coming full circle to be like, actually, John, did you know the biggest sex organ is the brain? <laughs> so it's fun to kind of bring back in that neuroscience of like, so what happens to people who, you know, have spinal cord injuries or what happens to people who don't have the normal anatomy? They can get have orgasms by rubbing earlobes. They can have orgasms by thinking about having an orgasm. Like that's how the body works. So it's definitely not like the clitoris is the end all be all, but it certainly is the major player. Um, so lots of different body parts can be stimulated and cause an orgasm to happen. But it's a pelvic floor contraction and the sensation of the pelvic floor contraction in the brain. And so certainly any place in the pelvic floor, if it's stimulated, will give you a different sensation if it's over here versus if it's over there. And that's where people will, you know, you can read products of like the 12 different ways and, you know, all the different locations. Again, it's not my job to tell people how to have sex. That is not what I'm interested in, but to say, you know what? Once you get out of the paradigm of penis and vagina equals a 10 minute experience where you're supposed, you know, once you get out of that paradigm, really the whole world opens up to be like, hey, what is possible? And then once you start reading about like the ear orgasms and, and like the mindfulness, or you're like, whoa, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like, you know, advanced level stuff, but it's possible. Right. And, and be, we just to be clear that we are. We're both urologists, and we are definitely not sex therapists. So, right. sex sex therapists uh, are are a totally different class of uh, therapy, and that is not something that we do. But because of 
the nature of our work, we we actually enter into that a little bit, and that's why it's important to uh, partner with your local uh, sex experts, sex therapy experts. For that, yeah, sex. I mean, sex therapists are just just to talk about how wonderful they are for a second. Sex therapists are basically. They're kind of like the urologists of the therapy world. So just like doc, not all doctors are good or great or comfortable talking about sex. Not certainly not all therapists are good or great or comfortable talking about sex. So the sex therapists are really the counselors and the therapists who are like, hey, this is important, you know. And they'll say, this is we're here because of sex. You know, if your parents didn't get together on the night they got together, you wouldn't exist, right? So that's how ubiquitous sex is in our world, and being comfortable talking about it, just you know helps. <laughs> so that's all sex therapists are. They're therapists who are comfortable talking about sex. And they're really good at kind of exploring techniques to say, hey, what else can you try? So they're very good at that. They're also very good at unpacking baggage that you might bring to to the, either A, your relationship or even just sexuality as what with yourself. Um, there's a new word for that. It's called like solo sexual. If you have sex with yourself and nobody else, you're a solo sexual. Solo sexual. That's a new one. That's a new one. Orgasmic inequality is something, uh, a phrase that I learned recently, and now solo sexual. Yeah, so orgasmic inequality, just so people know, they've done the research on this. If you look at uh, heterosexual couples, homosexual couples, male, male, female, female, every single person has more orgasms than the heterosexual female. That is the individual that has the least amount of orgasms. So same-sex couples have a much a more equal rate of uh, orgasm than if you're in a heterosexual couple. So why do you think that is? I think it's, oh, I think it's a couple of reasons, but I think one of them is our society not valuing female orgasms as much as male orgasms and saying the end of a sexual event is when the man orgasms. And so like the woman orgasming is kind of like this, you know, bonus. Um, so I think that's number one. I think number two is women really do want to please their partners. And for the woman to be actually able to say like, hey, this is important to me too. And I, my pleasure is important versus just wanting to please her partner, I think is another reason um, why we see that inequality. And certainly men, you know, because again, going back to the man of like, it's not their fault that they don't know. The, the women don't know. So let's not blame the men. But for the men to be like, like it's this elusive unicorn that might happen and they don't really have the skills or even the communication skills to say, hey, it's important to me that you have pleasure. And here's the hint. If the woman's having pleasure, you do things that are pleasurable. You're going to have more sex if the woman's having more orgasms. Wow, so much stuff to, to cover. It's like every, you say something, I'm thinking of all the things that we could uh, we could dive into with uh, with orgasms and with sex. And, and like you said earlier, it is so much of it is in the head. Right, super tutorials. It's, it's in it's in the head. Um, you you mentioned the uh, orgasmic inequality and also the you know the emphasis on men though being orgasms and and things like that. Uh, so much emphasis on men. Now there are some new developments as far as medication goes when it comes to female sexual desire. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's it's very very cool because I think. You know, for the FDA to finally FDA approve some medications for hypo, specifically hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is HSDD, which is a huge mouthful. But that's the technical medical diagnosis to get these medications approved. Um, I think it's I mean, I think it's good and bad. Number one, it's great because we're starting to talk about it. And women are starting to realize it's not just them, that this is actually a very common thing. And to almost kind of medicalize sex is like, well, doctors deal with exercise and diet and sleep and sex is just part of that healthy, natural life. So I think it's I'm, it's very welcome to me that it, it is being medicalized. So that's the good part of it. I think the, the not so good part of it is if you neglect the skills and the mindfulness and the clitoris, if you're neglecting all that and you really think that desire isn't a pill, you're going to miss out and you're going to miss out on all that good, important work and you're going to miss out on you it learning and exploring and you're going to be dependent not dependent like a, a addiction dependent but you're going to be dependent on a pill for it instead of the pill just being part so think of i think of it a lot like antidepressants and that's what one of them is which is the female viagra which is uh, addy so it is like it's like an, an, an antidepressant in the fact that it works in the brain so it actually increases the amount of dopamine and it kind of turns off that all too familiar 
what's for dinner? What's my job tomorrow? Do I have the lunches packed? Kind of decreases that and helps you focus more on the moment, which is when desire and sexuality arise. But it is a pill every day, kind of like an antidepressant is. And antidepressants work best in the setting of cognitive behavioral therapy and a healthy lifestyle and exercise. Same with this medication, right? It's not just a pill. And so they call it the female Viagra, which is great for publicity. But Viagra truly is kind of a light switch medication, <laughs> right? Whereas this is, you take it every single day. It takes about three months for it to kick in. They say if it hasn't worked after about three months, just stop. It's not working for you. But for somebody who truly does have that neurotransmitter kind of mismatch where they do need help with the desire um, neurotransmitters to go up, it works really great. And so I think, you know, it's good. It's a start. It's been said that dopamine is kind of like the accelerator for uh, sex and uh, and serotonin is more like the brake. So I think this medication may enhance that dopamine pathway and enhance the sexual desire for uh, for women. Uh, can you go in a little bit and, and discuss HSDD? Yeah, so hypoactive sexual desire disorder is, again, it's a mouthful, but it's basically an unwanted or undesired low sex drive um, for a prolonged period of time, which is very different to, you know, just again, I think education is so important because it helps so many, many women realize that they're normal and what they're experiencing is normal. Um, so HSDD different than responsive desire, right? So responsive desire is I'm not in the mood. I just got off of work. The kids just went to bed. I'm tired. I've got to get up tomorrow. I should probably go to the gym. Like I'm not actively desiring sex. But when my partner comes in and we get in the mood and we start some pelvic physical activity, my desire goes up and I can achieve satisfaction. That's responsive desire, completely stone cold normal. There's nothing wrong with you. Don't try to change it. Actually, that's the majority as women get older. So 18, most people, spontaneous desire. Like you wanted to sleep with all your locker partners. <laughs> so that goes away. Thank God. Could you imagine society if we were all a bunch of 50 year old, like spontaneous <laughs> desire people walking around, like we couldn't function. So I think that's where, you know, HSDD is truly a prolonged, and I'd say in the absence of, you know, education, knowing my body, working on the mindfulness, you still feel like, man, there is just nothing there. It might be a neurotransmitter problem. And it's absolutely worth, worth going into. But if you think there's a pill that's going to turn you into an 18-year-old spontaneous desire, like it, it would probably be a banned substance. Because, <laughs> you know, that's not what Viagra does either, right? Viagra doesn't turn a guy into spontaneous desire. Viagra just makes an erection more possible. You got it. Oh, my gosh. So what are some of the more uh, common female sexual health uh, problems that you see in your, in your clinic? A big one for me is not enough lubrication. And no, number one, just lube in general is good. There is something called, you know, again, educating to realize to tell people what they're, that they're normal, right? So there's something called desire arousal mismatch. And so a woman might be in the mood to have sex. She's like She's ready to go, but man, she's just dry. Her, like her vulva and her and aren't making the lubrication that is appropriate for her level. So that is that is a very common thing. That's why we need lube. 80% of Americans use lube. It's like a whole big industry of like tons of different things. So just lubrication decreases friction and friction can hurt. Friction's good, but too much friction's bad, right? So lubrication and can also help people have longer sexual, because remember a woman takes longer to orgasm than a man does, right? And if you're uncomfortable because it's friction and it's dry, you're not gonna give yourself the time that it takes to get there. So number one, lubrication. And then number two, as perimenopause, postmenopause, even breastfeeding goes in that really low estrogen status. So the tissues just kind of get dry and angry and it's not comfortable and you don't do things that aren't comfortable. So a big thing is just getting women on vaginal estrogen. Really around 10 years after menopause, you start seeing it really, really bad. So, you know, age 60 plus, average age of menopause in America, again, 51 years. Um, so by 10 years after having no estrogen, those tissues are just really thinned, really dry and super. Most women that I see, they've already stopped having sex years ago because they didn't know. They didn't bring it up with their doctors. So it's getting that vulva in shape so that you can be a sexually active human. And for those who are watching, I want to encourage you to ask any questions in the comments and we will try to answer them uh, during the uh, live stream. 
Now that's you know uh, lubrication um, and also uh, changes uh, around menopause. So I recently saw a lady, and I, I was doing a cystoscopy, and as per routine, I also do a quick pelvic examination. I could tell that the the rugae is lost, and also uh, there's a little bit of vaginal atrophy. So I inquired. I asked, "Are you having any sexual uh, pain, uh, painful sexual intercourse? Are you having lack of lubrication with sex, sexual activity?" It's interesting. Initially, she was hesitant. She didn't want to engage in a conversation. And then when I asked, she she started saying, "Yeah, well, it, I I don't really engage because it's uncomfortable." Because and then when I started talking about lubrication, I mean, her face lit up. It's like yes, lubrication. <laughs> Tell me more about lubrication. So, totally. yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, and it's this big stigma too, John. You know, in our society, like the idea for which might be mind blowing to men, but I'm just going to throw it out there. But like in our society, women aren't our pleasure and us taking time for ourselves. And I mean, all our society tells us is to give, give, give. Right. Be the best at your job. Give as much as you can to your kids. Be all you can be for your partner. And the role of like a, a woman actually experiencing pleasure and desire and her comfort and her enjoyment that comes way last. Right. And so it's like for a woman to even want to talk about, hey, my pleasure is important, is really kind of an uncomfortable foreign thing in this society. Well, there you know, fifty one change it one person at a time. I got to do something about it. Yeah. So 51% of the world, right? Female. And also one of my mottos is girls come first. So in order to, to achieve that, you have to be mindful of what gives a woman pleasure. And uh, you want to you wanna know how to negotiate that. And, uh, and uh, definitely mindfulness is, you know, so much of it is up here for sure. But then there are things that we can do to supplement uh, when the mental is, is there, but then physically we can help uh, these women, but uh, another one of these uh, big tenets is that communication. Just talking about the the issues, uh, physicians don't talk about it, the ladies don't talk about it, so it gets ignored. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, going back to the the, our education came from Hollywood, right? And so we grow up watching these images of sp simultaneous orgasms that happen after one minute because the desire is so incredibly intense. And here we are in long, happy marriages that aren't Hollywood, right? And then we wonder, we think that we're broken. Another resource for the men, um, so men and heterosexual couples that want to figure out how to have more pleasure for the woman is um, She Comes First. She Comes First, Ian, I don't want to get it wrong. I think his name's Ian. Um, fantastic book written for the men in heterosexual relationships on female orgasms and pleasure. So going back to, I won't tell people how to have sex, but I'll give them tons of resources. Yeah, sounds great. Speaking of resources, you uh, recently started a, a podcast. Uh, would you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so my podcast came, it came for, you know, a couple of reasons. Number one, I was just saying the same things over and over. Number two, in one week, I had two women in my clinic with pain with sex, and they just needed to, they weren't even using Lou. And so I'm like, here they are, like, They've made it all the way to a surgeon, which usually to get to a surgeon, you've got to go through a primary care doctor and you've got to decide it's that big of a deal to even get to your, so right. So they've made it to a surgeon and the surgeon's like, have you tried lube? <laughs> and one of the women was like, my boyfriend told me I shouldn't need lube. And then, you know, to go into like, I'm not going to tell you to dump him, but like you might, you might want to think about it. <laughs> so, well, like you said, it, there's just a lack of understanding on, on both lack of the understanding. So I was like, I can I got to the point where I'm like, I can't educate the world by people coming to see me one at a time in my clinic. Like, I'm not going to make a big enough difference doing that. So that's where the podcast came from. And to realize and you know, the more I'd educate women on responsive desire, because they'd be like, I have no desire. And then I would ask them, I'd tell them what responsive desire was. And they're like, Oh, yeah, no, that's me. When I have sex, it's great. I just don't want, and I'm like, you're not broken. You're nor, and so the name of my podcast is You Are Not Broken because it was just conversation after conversation of women of being like, you're normal. You just don't know it. You just don't know the, the science and the data of like what you're experiencing is normal. And once you embrace it to be like, oh, that's, I can work with that then. Oh, that's fine. All right. So the podcast has been super fun. And I just, I actually just did an interview today um, with a marriage, she was a marriage therapist. 
and now is all about kind of her her niche is like long term marriages and intimacy. And I'm like, it's so fun for me to to learn all of that stuff. Again, going back to the biggest sex organ and the neuroscience of it, of like, I'm I'm really great at the pelvis, but really a lot of it's up here. So that's my podcast. Thanks for asking about it. Yeah. So there's that. You're, yeah, you are not broken on iTunes. And everywhere uh, podcasts and are. Everywhere, you, wherever your podcast listening pleasure may take you. Yeah, I think I listen to it on Podcast Republic or something like that. Um, oh, the you, other, I'm just going to say one more thing. So it's been fun for me to just talk because I love interviewing and talking to people like this. But so the lube companies have been giving me free product to do for giveaways. <laughs> so that's been really fun. So I'm like, what else can I get for giveaways? So I, it's fun. Well, speaking of uh, more giveaways, what about, uh, uh, let's jump back to the, the orgasm and stimulation, um, sex toys and, and things like that. There are so many different variations. Uh, do you have any recommendations for uh, some of these ladies? Yeah, so, so congratulations. If you're interested in a sex toy, <laughs> they're not scary. They're, they're toys, right? So like they're just there to have some fun with like, Again, don't, if you're like, this sex toy is going to fix my relationship. It's not like, that's, what's so great about this is everything's complicated. It's this nice big stew, right? So a sex toy will not save your marriage and it will not save, you know, your relationship, but sex toys. And, and a lot of men are very, very intimidated by it, but here's the deal. Sex toys are, it's technology, right? It's, it's called like femtech is the name for it. Um, and it's getting kind of, it's, I don't know, it's getting kind of big or maybe just in my world because I'm involved in this now. Um, no, it is actually. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's getting so, so interesting. You probably know this. So at a big tech conference, which was a gadgets, basically, a female vibrator won best innovation. And yeah, so that was the, that, that was uh, at CES last year. Laura DiCarlo won the, uh, the best of innovation award. And uh, it, oh, there's a little bit of controversy. What was that? I said, thank you for knowing this. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, the, the best part was that, you know, she got additional notoriety because CES took away the award and, and then gave it back to her. So uh, after she called out the hypocrisy. And um, so she, she's uh, launched, I think, two to three products. Uh, I think she's based out of Oregon. So it's, it's very interesting. I've been watching her uh, because I'm also into angel investing and things like that. So I'm always looking for different products from different sectors. But uh very interesting product. Super interesting. I mean, and the way she, the way she called out the double standards, and the way she was like, "Yeah, but you should see what's go," you know, and called it out. And you're like, once you see that, you can. And then they gave her the award back, <laughs> which is so cool. Yeah, but her um, her product is the initial product is interesting. Uh, I think it's called Ose O S E. Uh, it has the uh, a clitoral stimulator and also a G-spot stimulator and the clitoral stimulator it has uh, it's more of a, a sucking type of a, a motion and the clitoral the uh, G-spot stimulator is more of a come hither type of a stimulation and you can adjust various things so there's that G-spot orgasm uh, super tentorial orgasm and also the uh, clitoral orgasm yeah and I think you know you can get it can easily get very intimidating for people because they'll be like 27 different combinations of vibrations and you're like oh my god <laughs> like, i'm just figuring out where my clitoris is like it's too much but they they also um, they also make the uh, simple simple model where it just stimulates one area so i guess uh, you can progressively move up yeah and i mean i think for a lot of people it's this is very intimidating stuff right and so it's like but what I think it is doing is it's it's helping educate people of like, hey, penis and vagina, if penis and vagina worked, these products wouldn't sell, right? Like it is actually truly filling a need for women's satisfaction that if if mother nature made a, made the best vibrator, we wouldn't have, but we make tons of stuff to improve our lives. Why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we do it for sex? Yeah, I think the world has been so, uh, uh, you know, I hate to say it, male centric, right? I mean, look at Viagra, look at, all the all the oral PD five inhibitors to help enhance male sexual performance, but we only have a couple for women, and we have yeah. five oral medications alone. Not to mention all the other uh, all the other stuff. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think you know another myth. If we talk about like what what myths hold us back is the myth that sex stops, right? Like you get married, you have kids, and sex stops. 
Like that's what society's told us. And it's like, that does not have to be how it is. That's how it commonly can be for a lot of people who don't do this work and explore what a healthy sex life is and how to prevent pain and how to have, make sure that everybody's having pleasure. So I had a couple in my office, you know, not too long ago. And, and they were like, doc, if you tell us that we could be having sex in our 60s and 70s, then we'll do blah, blah. And I'm like, absolutely, you can be having sex. In your, and I see, I see those people. I see completely happy 80-year-old couples. Like, you know, it's, it's absolutely possible. But that story, again, that society tells us is like, you, have, you graduate from college, you get married, you have kids, and sex stops. And it's like, well, it, that's not how. There's a lot of people having sex out there, people. <laughs> I, I, well, you and I, you and I have both seen these older men coming in for their ED erectile dysfunction medications, and they are like little. I I, th I, I think of them as little bunny rabbits. I mean, they're super sexually active. Well, yeah, and, and you're retired, and you know your health is good. Like, enjoy. Yeah. You know, like sex. Sex is just it's sleep, eat, exercise. Sex is just part of healthy living. And I think making that conversation safe for people so they can have it not only with their doctors, but they can also have it with their partners is incredibly empowering for people. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask this one final thing. And uh, this re relates to the, the lady that I just saw with the myovaginal atrophy. Uh, there does, I see so many ladies who are not on any estrogen and they're postmenopausal, or they are they are status post. They have their ovaries removed, and I see the the, the vaginal tissue is just so it, it's just atrophic. We call it you know you and I call it atrophic. It's it's not healthy looking. Um, what recommendations do you have? How do we educate people that possibly topical estrogen is the way to go, and and the safety aspects of it? Yeah, I mean I. I'm completely biased. I'm a urologist who treats pain with sex. I'm a urologist who helps women have sex. Like, I'm biased, right? But if you look at the data, so genital urinary symptoms of menopause, way over 50% of women who have, who have gone through menopause will have genital urinary symptoms of menopause. And as you keep aging, it keeps getting worse. It's a progressive condition, okay? So 6% of women with genital urinary symptoms of menopause are on vaginal estrogen, 6%. Percent. If we said, you know, 6% of diabetics are on diabetes medications, we, it would be an appallingly bad job at taking care of diabetics, right? And so if you take, again, the medicalization of it and only to normalize it, to be like, we are completely under treating general urinary symptoms of menopause, which also includes urinary urgency, recurrent UTIs, pain and dryness, not with sex, just in general, pain and dryness. I mean, if you went to a doctor and you said, my eyes are dry, and they said, well, that's just part of getting old. They're not going to say that. They're going to treat your dry eyes, right? And so it's a completely under-treated medical condition. I'm biased. I think that we all use sunscreen because it's been beat into our head that we've got to take care of our skin because otherwise we'll have damage. So we put on sunscreen all the time, right? And that's just like sunscreen's like seatbelts, right? We just do it. I think that about vaginal estrogen after menopause is like, if you don't do it, the progression of general urinary symptoms of menopause, you might not feel it right now, but you're going to feel it, you know, if you want to maintain your health and a, let alone a sex life or even just prevent UTIs or urinary urgency of getting that. And I think it would help if vaginal estrogen was over the counter. It is a prescription. And even though it's generic, it can be expensive. Um, you can get it compounded. GoodRx is a nice app to find the cheapest generic estrogen cream in, in your town. But so that's kind of, that's my mouthful because clearly I'm passionate about it and give like 10 estrogen prescriptions a day in my day job. You know, I, I try to recommend it to a lot of these ladies. Some will take in, some will not. And I tell them that is not just, you know, we've been talking about orgasms and stuff like that. It's not just for lubrication. It is not just for vaginal health. Like you said, it's for recurrent UTIs and urinary frequency and urgency. It affects not just the vagina, it also affects the bladder. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if you said, you know, if you just said, hey, if you, if you could be on something that would decrease your urinary tract infections and your urinary urgency, would you be interested? They'd be like, yeah, I'd be interested. And you're like, bonus points if you're sexually active that this is just going to preserve your tissue all the longer, right? Instead of coming in and asking for the sex thing, um, which in my experience, most women have already stopped having sex years before they come to see me for recurrent UTIs or bladder overactivity. Yeah, with a little bit of topical estrogen, we can take care of their urinary symptoms. And if they're interested, if they have a partner, they can engage in something fun that is uh, pleasurable to her. Lastly, 
if patients can't make it to you, can't make it to me, what are some resources, uh, say books or apps or anything like that, that you can recommend? Yeah. So I have a couple of books right here, which is really great. I'm in my, I'm in my studio. The Vagina Bible is amazing. This is written by a gynecologist, Jen Gunter. It's a thick book. You're like, wow, that's a lot. She said she was going to call it the Vulva Bible, but nobody knows what a vulva is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a that's a good one just for like basic health love it becoming cliterate is amazing this is Lori Mintz she's a PhD this is where orgasmic inequality came from <laughs> great I'm gonna um, I'm gonna link those up in the uh, video description yep that one's awesome this is an amazing one reclaiming desire this is by Andrew Goldstein a gynecologist based on the East Coast who deals with vulvodynia vulvar pain big big pain expert talking about libido starts here responsive desire, spontaneous desire, and how to cultivate that in your relationship. So that one's super good. Um, if you have girls, if you have little girls, girls and sex, this talks a lot about society and how society tells women that the man's pleasure should come first. She shouldn't have pleasure. Kind of what's going on in the whole college scene. Who knows? Was, are, is college going to happen anymore after COVID? Who knows? Is school going to happen? And is, is, school is school in real life going to happen? Back when they used to have college and put all the young people together, there's a big problem with um, um, hookup, the hookup culture and kind of what that does to women in telling them that orgasms are really impossible because it's really all about the man. So that's a very eye opening, especially if you have young girls to be like, start the conversation early because the 40 year old who thinks that her orgasm isn't important, she learned that way back then. And if you are a parent who cares about your daughters being equal to their partners, it's an important book to realize how society really doesn't help us have that equality. Well, I'll finish with this. In in this country, there's only one fellowship training program on female sexual medicine. That is the uh, that is the big problem, and uh, that's part of the reason I wanted to uh, do this because there's so few of you, Kelly, uh, Dr. Casperson, that um, that specializes that that is just so passionate about female sexual health. And um, I, I know urologists are not well trained during our residency, and I know OBGYNs are not well trained, and we can't expect OBs to do everything. So I think it's really important for number one, the patients to sk speak up, and also for the physicians to become comfortable to talk about this topic. Totally. I mean, you know, like you said earlier, it's a silent majority. This is 51% of Americans are female, right? And most relationships, just statistically, are heterosexual. And so that's where the, really the discrepancy comes in. And it's the silent majority, which is why it's so exciting to talk about because it really, I mean, we're here because of sex, right? Like it really is everywhere. And once you start talking about it, you realize like, oh yeah, this is just, you know, another interesting topic for to help people be healthy. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kasperson, for coming on the program. It's always great to chat with you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Hey, guys, if you have any uh, questions or concerns, uh, please feel free to leave it in the comments below. I will put all the references, the books, and and uh, uh, and also the, her uh, Dr. Kasperson's uh, practice in the uh, comments, uh, in the uh, video description. So if you're interested, feel free to uh, give a click and definitely follow her on her podcast. Have a great day. Bye-bye.